Welcome back to the Simple Farmhouse Life podcast. Today we're going to be chatting on a topic that you all seem to really love and enjoy, and that is decluttering and minimalism. I'm having on Stephanie from the Sustainable Minimalist podcast, and we're going to be chatting decluttering when it comes to kids, spouses, all of it. All right, join us for the interview. My name is Lisa, mother of seven and creator of the blog and YouTube channel, Farmhouse on Boone. Join me as I share with you my love for creating a handmade home from scratch cooking and a little mom and entrepreneur life along the way. We're here with Stephanie from the podcast, Sustainable Minimalist, and actually we're going to do a podcast swap. So we're going to record an episode for hers as well that I'm going to be on. So you can check that out. But let's start with some introductions. Tell us about you, maybe why you decided to go this route of a more minimalist lifestyle. And yeah, a little bit just about you and your business. Sure. Well, first, thank you so much, Lisa, for having me. I am a huge fan of your show. Do you want the short version of my journey or the long version? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Whatever you prefer. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess I'll do the medium version. I there am, again, the host of the Sustainable Minimalist podcast. I have a book by the same name, Sustainable Minimalism. And I wasn't always doing this. I didn't always care about the planet. And I didn't always think about you know what I was purchasing and what I was bringing into my home. I would say that things drastically changed when I had my first daughter and I became a mom. Prior to being a mom, I kind of just bought whatever I wanted, whatever I could afford, bought new outfits for work, you know, filled my little apartment with stuff. But then once my husband and I, our first daughter came along, the influx of baby stuff also came with her. We were living in an 850 square foot apartment. We had no room to store all the baby stuff. And so I thought, let's just declutter. Like minimalism was really hot circa uh, 2016. And I was like, I need to be a minimalist. Mm -hmm. But when I took all the stuff in our home that we weren't using and didn't need and shouldn't have spent our hard-earned money on, and I put it in a pile on the floor, I had a real moment, a real moment of reckoning, I like to call it. Because as I looked at this stuff, I realized that Number one, it was all taking a toll on the quality of my life, yes, but it went more further than that. It went to, you know, what is the impact of the creation and shipment of all this stuff all around the planet doing to the planet? And so I love the idea of minimalism, less is more living, but I think that a lot of the minimalist conversations miss the mark because it's not just about decluttering so that we, you know, are happier and lighter and more carefree. It's also about decluttering so that we look at the stuff we have and the stuff we buy through a critical lens so that we become more intentional moving forward. And that maybe wasn't the medium length story. I'm very sorry about that. That was definitely the long version. (laughs) Oh, that was not bad at all. Actually, right before I came out to this podcast, my husband and I were just having a conversation similar to this because he was talking about just in the last couple years of like certain times when he thinks to buy something that we haven't had before, but you get enticed like this, this thing's going to make everything just so much easier, so much better. And then you get it, and then after a while, you maybe find out that it wasn't something you really needed or it didn't really serve you well. And then it's always this, okay, well, now what do I do with it? Because whenever you have so much stuff to manage, to figure out where it should go that's going to be most appropriately used, that becomes sort of an issue too. And that's what I have run into as well. And it has made me think more about whenever I purchase something, okay, am I going to still want to be using this? in a year from now. And yeah, it's, it's more than just the money conversation about, you know, not spending money on things that you maybe don't necessarily need, but also even if you can afford it, it's like, well, but then what, like, where's this going to go in the house? Yeah. I actually just last night I was searching on Amazon for a pregnancy pillow. I've never had a pregnancy pillow. I have this, I'm pregnant with my eighth child, never had a pregnancy pillow this whole time. I didn't even know what a pregnancy pillow was. I thought it was just like a long pillow. And the reason I was searching it is because we just got back from vacation and at the Airbnb, they had a really long pillow and I could snuggle with it. I didn't realize a pregnancy pillow is like this massive thing that like conforms around your whole body. 
And all I could think of was this thing better be life changing if I'm going to bring in this like bed size. I didn't buy it. I just couldn't bring myself to do it. So anyways, I think you bring up a lot of really good points. And especially as a mom, uh, you struggle with there's a lot of items to be brought in. Oh, absolutely. The motherhood aspect really just throws a wrench into our best laid minimalist plans. But it is it is doable, I would say. Yes, it is. I've I've always been a minimalist kind of by nature. I've been thrift, kind of thrifty just by nature. It's just I don't I don't like buying things that I don't think I'm going to need. I don't like filling my house up with things. I think some people have like whenever they're feeling a certain way, buying something makes them feel better. And so that for them, this is tends to be more of a struggle like wherever you fall into that camp. So have you noticed that to be true? Oh, absolutely. Uh, Our emotions play huge parts in our purchasing behaviors. And to take that even a step further would be to say that the expert marketers and advertisers know how to capitalize on our sadness or our loneliness or our feelings of inadequacy to sell us more things and therefore to make more money. So it's a real rabbit hole if we want to go down there. But, you know, the the end goal for them is to sell stuff and make money. And it's not always, you know, the magic pill that you mentioned earlier, the thing that's going to make our lives so much better, solve all our problems. It's very rarely, if ever, that easy. Yeah. All right, I want to take a quick break from this episode to tell you about today's sponsor, Carly Jean Los Angeles. Carly Jean is a company started by a mom of four named Carly. Everything is made in Los Angeles, which is awesome to be supporting United States made and really quality pieces. So I'm wearing something here right now that I wear constantly that came from Carly Jean. I'm wearing it with my pinafore apron. But the Carly Jean clothes are made to be a collection. A lot of them, they even have capsules they put together so you can buy this capsule where you can intentionally fill your clothes with a collection so that you can wear things over and over again and mix and match and make looking beautiful on a daily basis just a really easy, straightforward process, which is exactly what I've been trying to do for so many years. We don't have closets here in our farmhouse. We have a armoire and I keep my clothes on half of that. And so I love being able to piece together something that I know I can reach in really quickly, get ready and be put together. And that is something that Carly Jean actually does for you. They have these curated capsule collections, which do exactly that and take a lot of the guesswork out with quality pieces made in America. So I love that mission and I think that you will too. So head on over to CarlyJeanLosAngeles.com. You can use the code FARMHOUSE20 to get 20% off your entire order. Now that's a one-time use code. So make sure to head over there, find some of the things that you like. Again, use the code FARMHOUSE20 at CarlyJeanLosAngeles.com. So what are some ways that you're intentional with what you buy? Like, are you, when you buy clothing, looking for a certain material or when you buy shoes, looking for something that maybe it's more expensive, but it lasts longer or bedding. I'm just thinking of all these things that I find myself like kids clothes, buying and replacing constantly. I need to be convinced that clothes that are more expensive or shoes that are more expensive actually last longer. I need to figure out what exactly people are buying when they say that, because just because it's more expensive, I find that isn't necessarily meaning that it's going to last longer because I've done that. I've bought like the name brand stuff like, okay, these are going to be our shoes for the next year. And then just like the Target pair, they wore out. And so like, what are some things you're looking for in your purchases to make that more intentional? Well, let me just say first off the bat, you know, your lifestyle sounds quite different from, you know, somebody sitting at a cushy desk in a perfectly ventilated office all day long, especially with kids too. You know, are you chasing around seven kids? Are your kids playing outside a lot? Are you playing outside with them? So that all definitely comes into play when we're talking about longevity of items. But I will say that here in the West, we are taught to buy things by looking for a deal, by snagging a deal and then bragging about it. Cheapest is best. 
But it's really about shifting our mindset. It's not about buying them the most expensive thing. It's about asking ourselves simple questions when we go to the store. The big one that I ask myself is, is this too cheap, right? Is this too mm -hmm. cheap? Just the other day, I was walking around Target and I saw $6 leggings for little girls. I have two daughters. And asking myself, is $6 for this item, which is made from cotton, which I looked at the tag, it was made in China, so to cultivate the cotton, to create the fibers, to weave into these pants, to put in a box, to ship to my my local store, does that all only cost $6? No, of course not. $6 is too cheap. Mm -hmm. And when a product is too cheap, corners are absolutely being cut. The workers who created the item are definitely not being paid a fair living wage, a living wage, not even a fair living wage, a livable wage. Mm -hmm. The planet. So the, all the, you know, toxic chemicals that come from dyeing the pants into that hot pink, beautiful color. What are they doing with those chemicals? They're likely dumping them. And so I think it's first about a mindset shift that the way we've been taught to buy, which is buy on emotion and buy the cheapest thing and buy a lot of it, quantity over quality, that's not working for our homes. That's not working for our mental loads. It's definitely not working for the planet. And so I would say that's step one. Step two, if you'd like me to go into it, is becoming a more conscious consumer. And again, we can we can go down that route if you'd like. <laughs> yeah, no, I would because I have found myself falling into the, yes, this is cheap, but no matter what I purchase, like I've, I've gone the route of, okay, I'm going to buy something that's nicer. And then I don't, I guess I don't know what I'm, sometimes I feel like I don't know what I'm looking for when I buy something nicer and it ends up lasting the same amount of time. And then it's just like, is it worth it to purchase all of these clothes for all of these kids and for myself at the more expensive price if they're not going to last longer? And I think probably the answer is like, well, it's not name brands because with that, you're just paying extra for the marketing, not the manufacturing, not the fabric, not the material. Now, if I was to, to go like, I was looking at some of these really small boutiques thinking about sourcing some cute like maternity dresses and whatnot. And I was looking at the fabric and it's not really made from more quality stuff. I find a lot of times too, it's not like there's extra stitching in the the seams. I guess what I'm saying is, yeah, as a consumer, how do you find stuff that you feel good about buying? And probably like secondhand is number one. It really is. I know, you know, secondhand stuff, hand-me-downs, thrifted items, it's not glamorous, but it really is a great way of acquiring items for nothing or very close to nothing. And especially like if if a hand-me-down item for your children, let's say, is getting to you and it's still in good condition, that's a real good indicator of the thing being quality, right? Like think about those Target leggings. They're not going to last long enough to be passed down to somebody else. They're not made for durability. They're made for a cheap price point. And so if you're getting stuff handed down to you, or if you have stuff from older children and that you can save for younger children, they're, they're in good enough condition to save, that's an indicator of quality. I will say for my children, I almost never buy them clothes. Never. Because they're horrible with them. Yeah. <laughs> they're absolutely horrible. Holes in knees galore. And why would I, when um, I have a great community of people, I'm very fortunate, who who will give me clothes? Now, for me, it's a whole other story because I don't have people dying to, you know, <laughs> give me hand-me-down clothes. And so it, again, is about going down the rabbit hole, finding corporations and companies that are aligned with your values that you've bought from before and you like their quality, you like the aesthetic, and also trusting third-party certifications. Those are those little labels, those little logos on products, and sometimes even brands are certified by a third party. That means something. That means that the brand has jumped through extra hoops to do better. A big one is certified B corporation. Maybe you've seen like the B in, mm -hmm. a, in a circle, right? Like there's a lot of them, Patagonia, Athleta. I love Athleta. I live in yoga pants. Mm -hmm. So, um, but you know, that doesn't mean that there's 
no impact. It means that the corporation is going to put profit below, you know, the planet. And that's important to me. So I'm willing to spend and support that. I think I also get lazy with when, and this does, I think this has been something that's happened as I've had more children with properly taking care of items too, with, with the kids. I don't, and I just, maybe this is just something I tell myself. I feel like I don't have the time to properly sort the laundry so that I am, you know, making sure everything lasts as long as possible, not dry, or not dry something or follow all of the instructions for the care. Or like, Whenever a child is eating frozen blueberries and they're wearing a white shirt, I'm not usually one to be like, wait, we got to do this or you can't go outside because you're wearing this. I just let it all go. And so naturally, <laughs> nothing that we have ends up lasting, whether it was there are certain things like flannel shirts or things with a thicker material or jeans, but not the jeans that have the stretchiness in them or hoodies, things like that. Like certain things will last, but most of our stuff, it never gets passed down to other people. I just, it never can make it that long. Yeah. It sounds like you have a, a certain lifestyle. I don't want to say like a, a more rugged lifestyle, perhaps maybe that's accurate or not. Yeah, there we um, go. But when we're talking about clothes, you know, you can also look up, look at the fibers that the clothes are made out of you know, a synthetic item that's synthetic's just a fancy way of saying an, a clothing item that's made from plastic, plastic fibers, they tend to not last as long, especially if you're putting them in the dryer. Think about if you put like a plastic water bottle in the dryer, what would happen mm -hmm. to it? Well, that's what's happening to our clothes if we're, if we're not, you know, taking care of them. And I totally hear you. I don't hang everything up all the time either. That's a lot of work. But if you're thinking about buying, you know, a sweater, and I'm using the sweater example because I'm wearing a sweater right now. L listeners can't see, but I'm wearing a wool sweater. You know, like if you if you were to buy a sweater based on the price tag alone, the cheapest sweaters out there are the synthetic sweaters, the ones made mm -hmm. of synthetic fibers. Maybe you can get one for $30. But if you think about the purpose of a sweater, the utility of the sweater, mm -hmm. it's to keep you warm. And so a synthetic sweater is not going to keep you warm nearly as well as a 100% natural wool sweater. The wool sweater is definitely going to cost more. It's definitely not going to look pristine. Like there's, there, you know, like on my sweater, there's pills and stuff, you know, like those little things that hang off. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but it's definitely going to perform its utility of keeping me warm for much longer than the cheap synthetic sweater would. Yeah. Well, I like the idea of learning how to take care of, like you said, your sweater pills. I'm sure you own a little thing that will shave that off and you have ways of, okay, I'm, I'm not, I'm going to invest in this sweater and now I'm going to learn what I need to, to make this last me for five years or however long it should, given that it's a fully wool sweater. Yes. Like if I put the sweater in the dryer, that would be terrible. Right? Yeah. So yeah, don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've been thinking about that more and more lately around my home. How can I take what I have and take care of it instead of replacing it? Take this certain thing that seems beyond repair and maybe add a patch or soak it in, you know, whatever stain remover or just however I can take this item and take care of something I already have without instantly trying to reach and buy something more. Yes. And just to piggyback off of that, like you're talking about repairing, mending, those are skills that I would say we've lost as the years go on. You know, my, my grandmother and my mom even were masters at the mend but I don't know how to darn a pair of socks to save my life. And however, those are important skills. I would say they've been lost though, because we have been conditioned again by marketing just to throw out and replace, throw out and replace. But throwing out and replacing is not benefiting our homes or our wallets. It's benefiting the companies. Well, I think it's also been a cycle of once it's been marketed and then we get used to the prices that's where the biggest pushback happens 
like when I try to show certain things, whenever the price points a certain amount, people think that you're crazy for even suggesting that because we're so used to it. I used to sell um, handmade dresses on Etsy and the price that I had to make it to put like my hourly wage into it, the fabric, all of the materials and supplies, it just can't compete. It's It just looks obscenely expensive to people a lot of times. Like back in the day when your mom darned the socks, they were probably socks that were worth darning because they took a certain percentage of their income to purchase it. And now socks are so cheap. Who would waste their time darning something that you can replace for 50 cents whenever your time, say you have a job and you make $20 an hour, I don't know. And so by spending a half an hour darning a 50 cent, it just all, it's like a vicious cycle of, okay, this doesn't even make sense. Like, how do I reconcile all of these things whenever the numbers don't line up? Yes, that is such a great point. I mean, the cheapness, like the inexpensive quality of the stuff that's on the shelves then creates, I believe you're saying, disposable consumers, right? Consumers with a disposable Yeah, because why not? It's not like right. a big loss. And so I, that's why right. I love what you're doing. I mean, you're making more <laughs> um, instead of purchasing. I think that's amazing. And that, I think that that's the type of pushback that perhaps we can all do on a on a small scale within our own little homes, our own little spheres. Yeah, yeah. All right, I want to take a quick break from this episode to tell you about a sponsor for today's episode, Azure Standard. I first learned about Azure Standard probably over a decade ago when I first started getting into real food. I was seeking out sources for wheat berries in bulk. Like I wanted a 50 pound bag because I had my own grain mill and I wanted to make my own bread, honey by the gallon, all kinds of dairy products like organic grass-fed butter, things that I was not able to find locally, or if I could, they weren't in bulk. I wanted a better option so that I could be obviously more economical to purchase these things in large quantities and then to stock my pantry well. That's something I'm very passionate about is keeping the staples stocked so that no matter what, if there's a big snowstorm or anything, I'm able to have what I need to at least make a lot of basic things and through all of my years of learning how to do a lot of these types of homestead, homemade things, I'm able to take those staples. Anyways, the company that I found was Azure Standard. And what I like so much about Azure Standard is it works like a co-op. So there are drops all over the country where several people get together so that they can get a large truckload for a lower price by combining the shipping, combining the purchase. We have a local drop that is about 30 minutes from us in either direction. There's several actually drops that I could be a part of. And once a month I place my order for, by now I actually do animal feed, I do organic raw cheese, a huge block of it. They don't just have bulk. If you're a small family, you're not ready to really stock up. What I like so much is they have quality. So you can find your organic sour cream, organic cream cheese, any of those specialty ingredients that you don't really want to go to Whole Foods for because it's really expensive. I can find it as your standard and I have been utilizing that for many years. Azure Standard is offering Simple Farmhouse Life listeners a 10% off your first order coupon. So you can go to azurestandard.com and use the code SPRINGHOMESTEAD10 to get in on that discount. Make sure when you go onto the Azure Standard website, on the front page, check out the seasonal produce. A lot of times, they will have a large amount of whatever is currently in season for a really low price. So if you're looking for some bargain shopping or just something that's really fresh straight from a great source, make sure to check out the seasonal produce. And then if you're like me, you're going to come up with some staples that you get over and over again, that it's very automatic. Just add this to the cart. Again, azurestandard.com. Use the code SPRINGHOMESTEAD10. Again, thank you so much to Azure Standard for being a continued supporter of Simple Farmhouse Life and a great company to source your food from. Okay, so we have some audience questions as well. I think we talked a little bit about minimalism with kids, but we can talk a bit about that. 
Uh, how you handle toys? You said you're you have a lot of hand me downs as far as wardrobe. Are you still keeping everything pretty minimal with that? Yeah. So one area where I'm not so minimal. The only area I would say is with the kids' clothes. Like if somebody's going to give me hand-me-downs, I'm going to take them and I'm going to organize them and I'm going to put them in labeled bins and I'm going to do my darndest to hold on to them for the time when my child reaches that age and I can pull out that bin Um, because it costs me nothing to do so. And again, just like we were talking about with kids, they are not gentle with their clothes. And so I'd rather actually in this case have more so that I don't have to go to Target and buy the cheap $6 leggings. I don't really think there's like a number of clothes items that children should have. I don't really believe in capsule wardrobes for kids. I think that you need to have on hand a good amount of stuff, especially like I live in the Northeast. We need a lot of stuff for the four very distinct seasons we have. Mm -hmm. Um, And if at all possible, when at all possible, get secondhand and hold on to it and be proud of that. Yeah, yeah. I used to, just because I felt very overwhelmed at season changes, I would always, well, what I still do is I get rid of anything that has holes or is stained beyond repair and then make a list, get out everything from the, the past years, see what I have for each kid and then make a list of like, okay, this kid needs two t-shirts, two pairs of shorts. Uh, usually around May, I do that like summer swap out. And I used to just go up to Target, buy it all. And last time, which was in the fall I went thrift shopping, which because I buy so few clothes, I feel like it really doesn't cost a whole lot more just to go to the place where I know it will be. If I go to Target, I will be able to walk out with the five t-shirts I need and the whatever pairs of pants or whatever was on my list. But I went to the thrift store and I was like, how do people hand down such nice stuff? Like, because my kids can't, like we, we go through it. I have a small collection By the end of that season, they're all like right now, they're all looking like they really need some new clothes because we did this in October when it started getting cold and it's been however, five months, I guess at this point, and they're all looking really bad. And so I assumed that there just wasn't good stuff at the thrift shop because who has good stuff to hand down? And turns out if you go to just a handful of good thrift shops, you can really knock the job, like knock it off your list very quickly as well. Mm Mm-hmm. And you can save money, even though Target has really cheap prices. You can even get what you need from a thrift store if you're willing to try it, right? You have to be willing to try something new. You can get what you need for even cheaper than Target. Yeah. Oh, I agree. I'm not above it at all. I just felt like it would take too much time. But I I used to mm-hmm. thrift a ton, like when I just had, when I was a lot younger or just had, you know, one child or whatever. But I was like, how am I ever going to come up with this list from a thrift shop? But they have some of those like mommy and me really organized places that it's like going to Target. Like they have everything laid out to where it's you will get what you need in one quick stop, which is kind of what I need it to be. Just a quick plug for um, like online thrift stores, too. Their names are totally escaping me at this moment. But uh, thread up and um, Poshmark. Is that what you're thinking? Yes. Thank you. They also have <laughs> kids' clothes. So there you go. Yes, I've done it. Yep. I got all our coats in the winter from there. Now, how do you handle toys? Every time I have a minimalist type of guest on, people always ask the same question. So we always talk about it when relatives are constantly giving you things and how to navigate that whole situation. Okay. So... Everybody has different ways of handling this. And I will say I have never heard the perfect answer and I'm not going to give the perfect answer. It's a really tricky, sticky situation. I am going to tell you what has worked for me with my in-laws and my parents. So the grand, all the grandparents. Okay. And mm-hmm. that is positivity and repetition. Positivity and repetition. So when you convey your wishes to the extended family, about not over gifting, you're keeping it positive. You're making your statements in a way that sound, you know, it's for the benefit of everybody. It's for the benefit of you and your wallet. It's for the benefit of my child. It's, you can still love on the child in question without over buying Mm -hmm. and without inundating them with stuff. And then the repetition comes into play too, because 
my daughter, my oldest daughter is now eight and it took a good seven years <laughs> to get here. So it's not like you're going to say it once to the in-laws and then they're going to get it and then everything's going to be beautiful and minimalist and you're going to have that Instagram perfect playroom. That was not my reality. I had to be positive and repeat myself over and over and over and over again for seven and a half years before something finally clicked for them. Don't forget, we are like taking the gifting paradigm which is giving kids a lot of stuff multiple times a year for every celebration. We're taking that paradigm and we're turning it on its head. So we're going to need to play the long game here. It's not a one and done thing. I also should say too, grandparents in particular, they really, or at least the grandparents in my life, they really benefit from options. So I have to stay ahead of them. If I need something, I put it on a, you know, like a wish list type deal. Like if my child needs a, I don't know, hat and mitten set, let's say, I'm going to tell them way in advance of, we celebrate Christmas, so way in advance of Christmas, because Mm -hmm. some people buy like in August, (laughs) not me personally, but also giving them options in terms of, you know, what if you, so my mother-in-law is a really amazing cook. What if you give my daughter, a cooking lesson. Like how amazing of a gift would that be? That's an experience. It's a clutter-free gift. It's memory creating for everybody. Or what if my youngest daughter just had her birthday last week? I said, mom, what if instead of, you know, the piles of presents, what if you take her out for ice cream? Just the two of you. Mm Mm-hmm. That was that was a present. Like, let's expand. Let's help our family members expand their views of, you know, what a gift is. Because it doesn't always have to be a perfectly wrapped thing. It can be going out for ice cream and having a great chat. Because I know that my kids may not remember what they got from their grandma on their sixth birthday, but they may likely remember the laughs they had with their grandma on their sixth birthday as they went out for ice cream and had quality time together. So just something to think about there. Yeah. I like the idea that you're suggesting it and not just getting angry about it. You're, you're taking the situation and then thinking, okay, how can I help this person figure out something that will work? Because I think that's where the reason why, it ends up being what it is, is we just have these cultural expectations. And I don't even have a clue on how to navigate Christmas because it's one of those things where I feel like there's no way I'm going to be able to change what goes down on Christmas with all the people in my life. (laughs) Every year, my (laughs) husband, he's, he is more conscious about all this stuff and he cares. And he's like, I hate that we're doing this. I'm like, okay, well then how are we going to change it? Because there's, there's really no way. It's almost like we just have to either have a lot of conversations, a lot of repetition, like you're mentioning, or just be like, okay, we're just going to do it. And just, you know, just try to navigate it the best we can. (laughs) Because, uh, man, yeah, it, my kids aren't the best at taking care of things. Some kids get a possession. They're like, okay, this is mine. I'm really excited about this. I'm going to keep it nice. I'm going to take care of it. Mine, it could just go to Goodwill on the way home and probably they wouldn't even remember that it never came out of the van. So it it really feels extra wasteful with my kids to do something like that, as opposed to like you're saying, like spending time with them doing something that would be so much more beneficial to them. So you're just telling me we have to have conversations with people. <laughs> yeah. It's <Which is> hard. <laughs> and then report back and let me know how it goes. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, that's tough. <laughs> But really good points. I want to take a quick break from this episode to tell you about the episode sponsor, Tubes & Co. I have talked about Tubes & Co. here on this podcast for a while, and that is because I genuinely love the products. Tubes & Co. is a small, family-run company, and it's made right here in the USA. I love it when I find small companies like that that I can feel really good about supporting, but then also that have products I don't feel like I'm compromising on. Like, okay, I'm buying this to support this company, but I'd really rather buy the drugstore stuff. Not the case at all in the case of Tubes & Co. They are an organic skincare company that uses quality ingredients like grass-fed tallow, nothing artificial or bad. You can be confident whenever you look through the ingredient list that it's all stuff that you would not mind 
putting on your skin. Your skin's the largest organ in your body and things that go on it can actually absorb in. I've been recommending these to everybody. Actually, just the other day, my mom texted me and my sister and said, hey, I'm putting a tube sorter in. Anybody need anything? Because we all love their makeup so much. Now, I've loved their tallow balm all winter. I keep it in a very prominent place in my house. Well, just right in the bathroom where I walk by it nonstop. So I can put it on my face often on a day where I'm not wearing makeup. I'll try to put it on three or four times so that way I keep my skin hydrated in these winter months. And I love how it absorbs in, unlike a lot of natural products. But the makeup, we love it. I have their liquid foundation. I have this eyebrow thing that's two-sided, so it makes it really easy to groom everything, their mascara. Really, I love every makeup product that I've tried by them. I have the, the highlighter, the concealer. I don't wear makeup every single day, but I do like to have a nice collection for podcasts and videos and you know, going out with my husband. Tubes & Co. is offering Simple Farmhouse Life listeners 10% off your order by using the code FARMHOUSE. So visit tubesandco.com and use the code FARMHOUSE. Okay, so other questions on minimal wardrobe is, are hand-me-downs worth the space to keep with multiple kids? I know for you, you're saying absolutely. You do like a lot of upfront work to make sure that you have these bins and you have everything sorted and easy to find. Yeah, so for your listeners who are living in tight spaces, it may not be worth it for them, right? Especially if the children's clothes, mm -hmm. the hand-me-downs are, you know, they're tripping over them while they're going to the kitchen, let's say, and it's creating extra stress. I would say if that's your situation, it's not worth keeping them. However, for those of us who do decide to keep them, I have some thoughts. The first one is, of course, you have to put in the upfront work of organizing it, organizing it by size and by season, and then separating it into bins or, you know, whatever your preferred organizational bin system is. You have to do the work up front. I would also, when you're doing that, take out the stuff that you know your children aren't going to wear. Like you can donate that and feel okay about it. The frilly dresses, my daughters like hate dresses. They're never going to wear them. So why would I keep them? Right. But if there's a good chance, you know, you, you keep them. And then on the bins, on the baskets, on the bags, whatever it is, make sure you write the size and the season and put them in a place where you're going to be seeing them often. So I hear a lot of times my listeners, they, they do the upfront work of organizing the stuff, but then they put it all in the attic, which is not somewhere where they go all that often. And then the time to use the size six summer clothes comes and goes and they totally forgot that they even had this. That's 100% my problem. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so <laughs> that is a situation where you just tweak your system a little bit so that you remember what you have. Maybe you're putting in a reminder on your calendar to check the attic at the start of every season. I don't know what it might look like for you, but for me, I keep all the bins in my basement in a prominent place right next to my workout area <laughs> okay. and they're all labeled and they're all like chronologically. So like the five X and then the six X and then the seven X. And so, you know, when the weather changes now I am, I've conditioned myself basically to look in that corner of the basement and see what I've got before I go to target, before mm -hmm. I go to any store. Yeah. So I've always, I've been back and forth with this. The last couple of years I have one big bin in the basement that at the end of the season, whenever it's, I, I do like the full swap out. So I, I wait till it's fully warm. Like that will be comfortably at the end of May here. I will do a big swap out. They won't have anything that they, that could be a winter item at all in their closet or in their drawers. And right now there's not anything in there that is shorts and t-shirts. And I have one bin for all the boys and it's just labeled extra kid clothes and it's just thrown in there. And so it's definitely not the upfront work, but I also, I've never had a very inviting basement. So our last house, it was a hundred year old house. This one's a 160 year old house. And so it's just more like a, I don't know, it's, it's a full basement, but it's yucky. <laughs> it's just not like a, it's not a place you would have your workout gear or anything. 
And so I we run a dehumidifier down there, but I feel like, okay, if I really care about something too much, I wouldn't really stash it down here because it's, you know, it's not the best place. But I could get better totes that have better fitting lids and probably get some shelves to get them up off the ground and take more advantage of the space that we do have to take care of that. But I also will say that we have so few clothes that hardly anything makes it. All the stuff that made it from last summer for all the boys could all fit into one tote. So I guess that's been my strategy. But sometimes I wish I had more options. I see people who look so put together on Instagram. My kids never look like that. And I think that's because we just have like five play outfits for each season for each kid. Yeah. And also Instagram's not real life. So <laughs> yeah, I, like, I know, I wish... but they all look so cute. I I've been looking at it lately. I found a couple accounts where I'm like, man, how can I get my kids to look like this? Like we never look put together. People are like, why don't you share more family photos? And I'm like, because <laughs> it's, we never look good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know. I know. But I, how nice would it be to see the Hundreds of photos, hundreds of terrible photos that those influencers took to get that one like perfect one, right? I'd love well, to if see they were those. just in nicer coordinating outfits. That would even be fine. It's <laughs> just that even if we all smiled, that you know we're just wearing like whatever we have. Nothing coordinated. Nothing. Uh, yeah. Well, I'm with you. So, uh, sometimes I think about it. Yeah. No, I'm with you. We we don't coordinate in this house. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> just wearable to keep you nice and warm and in the winter and yeah, cool in the summer. Okay, so a few questions on minimalism for adults. How to organize slash declutter when your spouse has a we may need it mentality? That's a very common question. I'm sure you get a lot. Yes, I get this question all the time. And this is like the grandparents question. You know, there's no magic bullet that we can all mm -hmm. just take to solve this problem. I would say, you know, if you and your husband have differing views on storing stuff, I, I have a, I have a couple of things. The first is, you know, you have your own stuff. And if you are interested in paring it down, um, you can absolutely do that. I want to empower listeners to do that. You can tackle your areas, like the just you areas, like your closet, like your beauty products. You can also, if you are the person who is traditionally in charge of maintaining the household as I am, if that's you, you can also tackle the like common areas, like the linen closet, like the kitchen, like the mm -hmm. living room. Those are all you know, common areas. But if you're in charge of maintaining them, then you're, you're what you want goes. Mm -hmm. Now I would stay away from your partner's stuff. Do not declutter right. their closet <laughs> or their like areas that is going to cause major strife in your relationship. So just don't do it, but start with your stuff and then start with the common rooms and See how that feels for you. You're still going to receive a, the benefits of minimalism, a reduced mental load. You're going to feel lighter. You're going to have less stuff to clean. You're going to have more free time. Like you're still going to get benefit. And I bet your partner is also going to experience some benefit too. And fingers crossed, in a perfect world, they'll also jump on board. I mean, I will say that doesn't often happen because if they want to hold on to stuff that's like ingrained in their DNA, they're mm -hmm. not going to be so willing to change. But that doesn't mean you can't do your own stuff and the common area stuff. So start there. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. That's something that we've kind of done because I definitely am one to be a little bit more minimal minimalist with things. But I like you, I'm pretty much in charge of the house. And so for everything except, you know, those those areas, I can at least keep that under control. And so it's not like a all or nothing thing. It's not like if I can't do absolutely every space in this entire house and this farm and the barn, then it's all, you know, it's, it's all a waste. Well, no, there's definitely, you can do what you can. Mm -hmm. So, okay. A few more here on the minimalism for adults. Okay. How to fight the urge to decorate for season slash holidays without buying new. Okay. So I had Joshua Becker on my show, the very famous minimalist. And I asked him this question and his um, advice, his wisdom has worked for me in my home. And that is you use the concept of boundaries, storage boundaries. So let's just take the Christmas example, because we were talking about Christmas before. 
If Mm -hmm. you feel as though for the size of your home and for your level of Christmas festivity, you need to have three plastic lidded bins for your Christmas decorations, right? Three, Three bins feels right to you. Then use that as your space your storage boundary. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to buy more things because then you would have to either A, get another plastic bin, but you've already made your line in the sand. Three feels right for you. So so if you buy more things, some other stuff has to go to make room in the already designated three storage bins. So, So it's first about deciding like how much space do you have and how much of that space do you want it put aside a lot for the decorations. And then once you've decided that, you decide, you know, what's the best of the best? What is going in these bins? Because if we're just willy-nilly buying stuff, then we're also willy-nilly buying more bins. And then also too, you know, especially with decor items, like if you have a lot of one item, it makes it harder to appreciate, enjoy, and truly see the individual items, right? Like think about a collection of something. Maybe around Christmas you have, this is a real life example. Do you remember snow babies? I I don't don't. know. Are are they still around? I don't know. (laughs) Okay. They're these super, and I'm sorry to anybody listening who loves snow babies. They're these super (laughs) creepy little baby dolls, like toddlers, like doing things in the snow. Okay. And my grandmother like had a, look at, like Google it after we're done talking, Lisa. Okay. You'll be shocked and surprised. (laughs) (laughs) But like, Mm. like my grandmother had a collection of snow babies. Okay. And (laughs) she would put them all together at Christmas on the mantle and she'd like really just organize them in such a wonderful way. But the problem is when you have a lot of something, you're not looking at the individual snow baby. You're looking at the whole collection. Same with all Christmas decorations or all Easter or all Valentine's Day or whatever, whatever we're celebrating, right? If you put out too much, we're not like enjoying the individual items. And so a powerful way to decorate and enjoy those individual items that you purchased or acquired with love or was handed down to you with love is to just put out less stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. I also try to add a lot of natural things too, which can be expensive. So if the goal is, you know, spending less, sometimes the natural things, well, those are just going to be composted afterward. But at least, you know, you don't have to worry about sorting it, making sure that the bin doesn't get moldy. If the basement's wet or whatever, um, that's, that's a definite advantage. Okay. Last question. After decluttering, what are your tips to be more intentional to prevent bringing more things into the house that you think you just have to have? Yeah. So this really comes to the full circle, right? To the conscious consumer aspect Mm -hmm. of our conversation, which is what can we do to prevent being on that hamster wheel of decluttering and purging and decluttering and purging? I suggest always we put up barriers to buying. That's like my number one go-to. Because, you know, especially with the rise of e-commerce and online shopping, you know, you know, the barriers to purchasing are nil. It's way too <laughs> we easy. Can, yeah, we can <laughs> swipe right and there we are. So mm-hmm. instead of that, why don't we sleep on it? And again, sleeping on it is not glamorous. <laughs> it's not glamorous, but why don't we just put some time in between the swiping and the and the purchasing? Why don't we sleep on it? And I'll tell you, this is my first and go, always go-to strategy. And by morning, 90% of the time, the thing that I was looking at the night before has lost its luster. Mm-hmm. It's lost its luster. I also have a little mantra. Again, mantras aren't all that glamorous either, but it works for me. And that is, I wish I knew who said this because it speaks to me. It saved me from so many unnecessary purchases. And that is, (laughs) today's it item is tomorrow's clutter. Mm -hmm. So whatever is like hot and cool and is being marketed through targeted advertisements to me right now, it's going to lose its luster, you know, by maybe six months from now. And so when I think about purchases in that way, I feel like it takes the glamour out of the marketing. 
Like no product is going to solve all my problems. It's just not going to happen. No product is going to make my life substantially easier. Living is hard. Life is difficult, right? There's no thing that's a fairy godmother. There just isn't. And so knowing that like fundamental truth makes purchasing a lot less enticing. I've even heard, I don't know if you've heard this, but I've heard that the they've done some kind of study where they figured out that all of the dopamine in your brain or whatever it is that makes you feel good whenever you purchase something new happens when you like, it was just when you add it to the cart and maybe purchase it, but not actually after that. So somebody had some kind of strategy where you just like pick all the things out and add them to the cart. And then that was it. Another thing that I like to think about is sometimes we're buying into the whole story. So like certain brands, they have like a really powerful story behind them. That's marketing. That's how we market our podcast. That's how we market our blog. You create this whole thing that people are buying into. And I'm just thinking of this certain baby carrier I have that is so pretty. <laughs> and I love it. And like, part of me was like, oh, I want to buy another one for the new baby. I'm like, but why? I already have one. What I want and I just want to buy it again. But if it was, if that same item, sometimes you have something that's like, it's packaged beautifully. It, it looks really beautiful the way it's presented on Instagram. If it was shoved in like a Ziploc bag, hanging at Goodwill on a hanger, would you pay $200 for that baby carrier? No, you'd want that to be like $25 because just because out of context, it's just a little thing again. Like it's not this do you know what I mean? Like it's it's the whole thing that you're buying. And it's yeah. like, okay, if this was at Goodwill, shoved in a little baggie, hanging just on the little shelf, would I the exact thing, like literally the exact thing, no scratches, no marks, no stains. You know, does it have that same feeling? And it's like, well, no. <laughs> How can I get this feeling then, you know, without the purchase? Hmm. Yeah, I don't know if I have an answer for that, but I totally hear what you're saying. There, a lot of the glitz and glamour of these items comes in the presentation, comes in the words used to, you know, on the package to describe the item, comes in the influencers who are trying to, you know, tell us how great it is, who, by the way, are obviously getting paid to say how great it is. And so, like, when we strip all that away, at the end of the day, it's just a thing. Yeah. And we really need to feel that like deep in our bones if we want to change our purchasing behavior long term. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So tell us where we can find you, follow up with you and whatever resources you offer. Well, where to begin? Uh, the podcast is Sustainable Minimalist. You can find it wherever you listen to podcasts. I'm up there with you on the top home and garden charts. So congratulations to you. Your podcast is amazing, by the way. So I'm so excited to, you know, glean your wisdom up there on the home and garden charts. Um, my book, if you want to go a little bit deeper, is called Sustainable Minimalist. You can check it out from your library. I don't suggest going to Amazon to purchase it. I wrote it. I think it's good, but we don't need to purchase it, right? <laughs> Especially after our conversation today. And I'm on I'm on social media at Sustainable Minimalists. All right, awesome. Well, thank you. And also, we're going to be recording an episode for her podcast. So make sure to head over and check that out as well. Thanks again so much for joining us, Stephanie. Thank you, Lisa. This was so much fun. All right. Well, thank you so much for listening to this episode. And I will see you in the next one of the Simple Farmhouse Life podcast. <laughs>